In a land of endless teen dramas, writers and networks are constantly asking themselves, how do we keep audiences in interested? Riverdale has kept audiences captivated for several too many seasons, and the question is, how? I think an important place to start is just the evolution of the teen drama. So let's start in a land far, far away, Cape Side. Dawson's Creek wasn't the first teen drama to exist, but it was arguably one of the most groundbreaking. And we've all seen famous memes of James Vanderbeek crying on a dock. Dawson's Creek was at its core a coming-of-age story with story arcs that covered mental health, sexuality, and addiction, all conveyed by relatable and grounded characters. No off-the-wall storylines here. Dawson's Creek then gave birth to shows like One Tree Hill. One Tree Hill kept the hometown feel and relatable characters, and they added ambition. All the main characters go on to lofty and famous careers. Realistic? Absolutely not. But it did add a level of fantasy and daydreaming to its characters that I think audiences still really relate with. What kid in a small town doesn't want more, more than where they are? It did push the envelope of what teen, teen dramas genu generally explored. Peyton got a stalker. Brooke got assaulted. Jamie had a crazy nanny that tried to kidnap him. Dan shot his brother and Nathan got kidnapped. However, these storylines are offset by the characters exploring their humanity and how these events changed them. Enter Gossip Girl. Immediately set in a world out of reach for most, every storyline was heightened. Bart fakes his death, Serena gets drugged and dates a convict, Chuck trades Blair for a hotel, and then takes a 16-year-old's virginity. I'm Chuck Bass. It's ridiculous, but somehow still real. You try to relate to the characters, you see the situations they're in and think, well, yeah, if I had money, which was the point. These shows were great building blocks to what is now the phenomenon of Riverdale. The show is essentially a writer's workshop. It's, um, it's a safe space where writers can try whatever they want and it all goes to print. Um, I'm still debating with whether or not that's a good thing. Season one has more teen drama moments, but it's at its core a murder mystery. So let's go into some of the Best season one dialogue. Six more reasons for you to take that ginger bull by the horns tonight. It's just... Read my glossed lips, Justin Ginger Lake. You should be the queen bay of this drab hive. You wanted fire? Sorry, Cheryl, bombshell. My specialty's ice. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. Have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on? That's weird. Why are you getting so upset? Season one is its most grounded and yet still filled with plenty of uh, unrealistic moments and truly incredibly bad dialogue. Betty and Ronnie kiss for exactly no reason. And in a show that's, that ends up actually being really good LGBTQ representation it's a very out of place and it makes sense in the pilot because the show clearly hadn't found its footing yet i mean they still haven't um or maybe they did the the world will never know we glimpse a teen drama moment with betty just dancing around a room in her cheerleading uniform um and feeling pressure from her mother and then rebelling a little bit and we immediately dive back into outrageous when hermione discovers a uh, uh giant bag of cash in their hotel suite apartment thing season one actually does a reasonable job of balancing the hometown moments and the grounded character interactions with the unrealistic and ridiculous storylines um the interactions with archie and his father and the kids questioning their futures and trying to figure out who they are is very real and it fits the original like genre that riverdale is claiming to be the murder murder mystery actually adds a different twist to the show that makes it interesting if you can look past the the dialogue guys I, kj appa got that taylor lautner contract he's got to be shirtless at least 75 percent of the time because a teen drama is not a teen drama unless you're sexualizing grown actors that are supposed to be playing teenagers teenagers teenage characters that are sexy because why um, the sheer volume of pop ref pop culture references in the show is so 
unbelievably unnecessary. Watch it, Wednesday Adams. <sighs> Look, it's the rich kids from the Goonies. Wonderful. Ten minutes in, and I'm already the Blue Jasmine of Riverdale High. Season one is actually upsettingly good. I say upsettingly because we know where it goes. Um, the teen drama based with the twist of a murder mystery is is brilliant, and some of the scenes have very well built tension and character development. The acting is good with what they were given and certain moments are very well written um, but the absurd amount of hilariously bad dialogue really sinks the good moments i called it a writer's workshop earlier um and to expand on that it's like being in a freshman level screening class screenwriting class and the whole class is writing a short film together there's this one guy who's really talented but he's surrounded by a bunch of students whose philosophy is to shake a hornet's nest in throw it in the middle of the room and see what happens. Now, after a show completes its first season, you see one of two things. One, you see the show run runners desperately trying to stay relevant and interesting. So they lean really far into what they think made their first season successful. Um, and then they amplify it. This happens whether or not the show was planned past the first season or not. Um, season two of One Tree Hill up the drama. The second season of Pretty Little Liars had to add mystery to their mystery show. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Or two, the showrunners get brave and they try something new, feeling safe and comfortable in the fact that they got renewed. We're talking about how networks worked. This sometimes happens in later seasons, um, after they've been renewed a few times, um, in, a, in an attempt to keep things interesting. We saw this with Vampire Diaries introducing the originals, arguably one of its better seasons, and then it quickly went downhill after that. Riverdale, however took this to an extreme um the only real similarities it shares with season one is that the characters exist and the dialogue is atrocious oh and we have another murder mystery only this time it's a serial killer betty's dad is the town serial killer jughead joins the Southhead serpents betty does a sexy serpent dance in front of literally everyone including her mom Archie gets manipulated by Hiram into fighting fire with fire. He forms the Red Circle, which is just a bunch of untrained vigilante football players. Because that's who's going to stop a serial killer. Overconfident teenagers in red ski masks. Juggy is joining the surface, Serpents, and here's possibly one of the most upsetting things about this show. The acting is good, and they are doing the best with what they've got. And in its quieter moments, the acting, particularly by Lily Reinhardt, um, and Cole Sprouse is phenomenal. They have great chemistry. They were beautiful together. The other hilarious thing about the acting is all the parents are like big deals, yo. Skeet Ulrich, Luke Perry, Molly freaking Ringwald. Like, come on, how did they end up on Riverdale? It, most of them were on a teen drama themselves. Molly Ringwald was the teen girl of the 80s. Like, but Riverdale and all together at once. Um, now, through all the ridiculous things that happened in season two, it somehow remains Riverdale's best season. Arguably, it's the most compelling storyline. We start to, but we also get to start to watch the train leave the tracks a little. Betty doing the serp serpent dance. I have many, many thoughts on this, but let's start with maybe the reason this is the reason poor Lily Reinhardt hates the show so much because we're over sexualizing characters that are in high school. Now, the girls of One Tree Hill have their own podcast, and they've talked a lot about how they were treated by the older men in power as young women on set. Now, no one knows what goes on behind the scenes unless the actors tell us, but I have a hard time believing that the production team that is nearly all men that insists on sexualizing high school characters um, isn't problematic. Just because the actors playing the characters are, are, are of age doesn't make it okay. Um, though a little more out and left field, season two was still at its core a murder mystery, just with a serial killer. Um, that happens to be the father of one of our main characters. This season still has some profoundly 
teenage moments like when veronica and jughead decide the best way to even the playing field is for them to kiss and betty and archie just have to watch um that was a fully teenage response to jealousy and insecurity and i found it hilarious the fact that season three is completely built around dungeons and dragons um, oh i'm sorry griffins and gargoyles is a it was a choice um we must also talk about the role of musical episodes in this show. I'm a musical theater kid. Um, now, musical episodes on television are common. Once an entire show, once in an entire show, like Buffy, Grey's Anatomy, Supergirl, all had musical episodes, some of which were pretty well received. Every single night, the same arrangement, I go out and fight the fight. It's fun once in a while. It's a break from the reality of the show, normally introduced at a point in the story that is simply too heavy to continue without some kind of alleviation. Um, but in a world like Riverdale, one that is so off the wall and continues to have filler episodes, the amount of musical episodes they somehow add is ridiculous. Um, now, music has always played an important role in the show, but not in a true introspective and meaningful way like it does in one tree hill and not an entirely numb way like it did in glee it walks this line between being relevant and completely out of place um when a musical episode when the musical episode started they at least fit the overall aesthetic of the show carrie heathers somehow fit into the tone of riverdale hedwig was pushing it but it's fine but I will never, I will simply never forgive them for what they did to Next to Normal. She fades away. Super boy and the invisible girl. The show is emotional and weighted and vocally impeccable. And it's underrated Broadway brilliance. And not a single person in that cast, besides Lily Reinhardt, has the vocal chops to listen to the show, let alone sing it. And I think that was my biggest problem with the musical episodes is the talent in your cast is so underutilized. The best voice in the regular cast is Lily Reinhardt. And then we have the other girls from Josie and the Pussycats that aren't Josie because they're better. So sorry. Um, yet the rest of your cast is singing all the songs. And with Heather's, I was in the show. It physically hurt me. Like, I'm sure the tone deaf casuals love it but you're physically hurting all the theater kids. And I want you to know that. Um, now this it, it's Riverdale falls into um, a lot of teen drama tropes that most, if not all of these teen dramas that we've talked about have a love triangle. We started off with like some tension between Archie and Betty, but where uh, she ended up with Juggy and a love triangle exists somewhere. They really don't, lean into it as heavily as other teen dramas do, but it happens in passing. Teenagers solving a mystery. Riverdale's definitely not the first ones to do this. Like Pretty Little Liars was built off of this, as was a Teen Wolf. Like this is a trope that exists. Heightened stakes. Gossip Girl, Euphoria, Euphoria The OC, 90210. Everything is dialed to 11. Um, because they have to make you care. They have to make it interesting. Um, teen dramas take what's real and what's relatable and they shove it at you after blowing it up. Like they need it to be big and major and noticeable. Over-sexualized teenagers, all of them. Missing or absent parents, all of them. Like this, all things Riverdale does as well. Um, my favorite thing about this show is that the producers and writers really double down in sincerity whenever they talk about the show. And it's funny. And the funny thing about that is if they would just market the show as a satire of teen dramas, it would be regarded as one of the most brilliant shows in history. And it would give them the license to do whatever they want. The crazier, the better. They would change nothing about the show. They just wouldn't be a laughing stock. That means you haven't known the triumphs and defeats, the epic highs and lows of high school football. And cause the audience to genuinely question their sanity. But apparently it's serious. It's for serious, guys. Uh, 
season three involves a prison break, the farm, and of course the epic highs and lows of high school football. Now I will say that the performance of Jailhouse Rock is probably the least offensive throughout the entire show. It's still utterly ridiculous. Um, now, though most of these notes were taken during a rewatch, I physically couldn't handle watching the show anymore. So let's discuss the time jump. Also a mark of teen dramas and a lot of shows, um, One Tree Hill, Dawson's Creek, Gossip Girl often use the skip of the inevitable, inevitable um, college separation, not Gossip Girl. Sorry, we totally saw them go to college. Um, the problem with Riverdale's time jump is that the show is so inco it's it's so incoherent and forced just before the time jump that when we came back, the very specific and seemingly random seven year time jump was just a little much. They forced Archie and Ronnie apart, um, as well as Betty and Jughead, and it's not what the characters wanted to do. It didn't make sense to the flow of their storylines at all. Um it was it was story forced, which shows fundamental flaws in the screenwriting, uh, and not just the obvious dialogue and plot ones. Um, but the time after the time jump was very awkward. The story seemed lost. Um, the thing with Riverdale is, as weird as the story might be, the story is always clear. The there is always a very weird but distinct plot that is at least coherent. Season five doesn't have a clear plot. There's a vague idea of one, but there's no development, and the scenes that could be called plot points are all over the place. Um, and then we get to this origin episode with Hiram Lodge, which was interesting. I've mentioned how, for the most part, the acting isn't bad, but the dude that plays young Hiram Lodge is so terrible. His eyes have no expression. His delivery for every single line was the same, and it looked like he didn't know what to do with his mouth when he talked. The whole episode was, it was weird and unnecessary. It really just solidified that after the time jump, the writers just really didn't know what they were doing. So I guess we were trying to give Hiram Lodge a redemption arc. Um, weird choice, but all right. Reggie going back to make amends with his physically abusive father. Like these are just bad, bad choices. Um, damaging choices there's there's bad writing and then there's forgiving abusers and murderers that have been terrible people for the entire run of the show and writers have a responsibility to the general public to not promote garbage the idea that you should go back to your family because they're family even though they're abusive is is trash and we need to get rid of that mindset just eradicate it from existence please um also movies exist in canon but everything else just gets bullshit fake names like Marsha's Vineyard and Lacey's and a Glamourage egg. It's so bad, but somehow Coyote Ugly exists. Okay. Honestly, of all the things this show has done, Cheryl starting a ministry with her mother is the most out of left field shit that they could have come up with. The thing that bothers me the most about the show is probably the inconsistent cinematography. Now, normally, once a show establishes its style, the only major change comes from something like doing a crossover episode or a musical episode, and the directors want to make a tone shift very clear. But Riverdale uses basic teen drama cinematography, first-person camp shots, high-angle close-up shots, as well as for the drug trips and the way too many random moments that they don't seem to fit in. And what looks like attempts at horror movie jump cuts just done really poorly. They either can't seem to decide what their style is, or they are simply trying to be creative and they're failing miserably at it. Because um, all of that just makes it very jarring for the audience if you're not going to be consistent with your um, with your cinematography. It, it's, it makes it very difficult to watch. For the most part, Riverdale works in archetypes, much like the original comics. Riverdale takes these archetypes to the extreme, Archie being the golden boy, the jock. Cheryl lays it out in season five. He's been a, a soldier, a fireman, a football coach. He does good. He is the hero. Um, Jughead is the outsider, the sleuth, the loner, the kid from the wrong side of the tracks. Um, if we're using uh, Union... Oh, I can't talk. <laughs> If we're using Union archetypes, Juggy would be the rebel, 
He's always trying to solve something, to fix something, a, a crime, his family, his writing. But no matter what he does, he always ends up alone. Veronica's the princess. She's the rich bitch. I would argue she share, shares the same archetype as her father, the ruler. She is in charge. She thrives in chaos. Um, and she always has a plan. Betty is my Black Widow. She's the fighter. Betty is a very extreme version of the explorer. Um, she needs to take risks, discover things. Um, she always runs headfirst into whatever danger awaits her. Now, most stories deal in archetypes in some form or another, but the thing with Riverdale is that it only deals in archetypes. Bad teen dramas have been well-received for decades now because of the human connection, because of the universality um, of the emotions, because of the audience's attachment to the characters. But with Riverdale, there's nothing more. These archetypes are all there are to the characters. There's no depth, there's no heart, there's no weight to them. There was starting to be in the first few seasons, but as the show went on, there was less and less to the characters. And it became about the story driving the show instead of the characters, which is never a good way to tell a story. I'm not saying there aren't good plot-driven stories, but there aren't. Um, <laughs> I will say Josie calling out the craziness of her high school friends was a great moment, if for no other reason than it shows that the show is at least somewhat self-aware. Granted, it could have been a complete accident. I might be giving the writers way too much credit, but I choose to believe that the writers meant to apply, imply that after leaving Riverdale, you gain perspective and aren't completely desensitized to the insanity that is that town. So really any episode of Riv on Riverdale could be a musical episode, and I say this with complete love and respect to the cast, but the distribution of songs is so, so incorrect. The people who sing the most over all the seasons are Archie, Josie, and Cheryl. Let's just go with, uh, they should not have been singing that much. The characters that we rarely get to hear, Valerie, Mallory, Betty, have incredible voices, and they are wasted. I, miss my mother. Um, I also think it's hilarious that when Kevin thought Cheryl's ministry was about wor wor worshiping Jason. He was chill with it. But when she said they were worshiping Gaia, that's where he draws the line. Worshiping actual ancient religion? No. Worshiping her dead brother? For sure. And she's is she got magical powers um somehow? Literally no real explanation, but uh, okay. Um Really opening season six with a very long on the nose Twilight reference, and it was a bit much. Um, misusing La Lorena was a little gross. Um, that was definitely a team of all white writers, and that was a little unacceptable. The show has done some out there shit, and that's fine, but disrespecting an actual cultural story is a little bit ridiculous. You're not you don't get to put your spin on cultural stories, by the way. If you're if you're using lore from an actual culture, then do that actual story. You're not allowed to change it. That's what makes it disrespectful, especially if it's a white person changing it. That just doesn't look good. Just don't do it. Either do the story or don't. Okay, great. Um, they could have called her the woman in white or the weeping woman, the way Supernatural did, and it would have been fine. But considering the actual translation is wailing woman and they insisted on calling her La Lorena, as well as telling her story wrong, unacceptable. There were ways around that and they chose right through. Um, there's this phrase used when talking about television shows that push the boundaries, jumping the shark. This is a reference to the show on Happy Days where they literally had Fonzie jump over a shark. The phrase is usually used to determine whether or not a show has gone too far, broken past its boundaries and failed. Now the reality is that Riverdale has had many jumping the shark moments from Juggy faking his death to Archie getting attacked by a bear to the prison break to Betty taking down the trash bag killer. The show is known for pushing boundaries and testing its limits. And Riverdale is coming back for season seven. And dear Lord, I hope it ends for the sake of the actors. Watch any interview they're in. And they, they, they hate this show so much. Um, they can't take it seriously either. Um, and I do believe it's coming to an end, finally. Um, but 
Riverdale just has this weird license to do whatever it wants. And and I think right now they're just thriving over the audience being entirely confused. We don't know what's going on. The cast doesn't know what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. And the writers are just leaning into that wholeheartedly. Um, I think they should stop, but the damage is done. It is what it is. Um, we posed a question at the beginning. Does treating this like does this show treating itself like a writer's workshop benefit writers or does it kill us? Um, is the structure of the show a good thing? And I think <laughs> though it gives writers creative license and the freedom to do what they want, I think overall it hurts the industry more than it helps it because it encourages bad storytelling and writers are constantly told that you need to get the bad draft out first, but then you're supposed to fix it. You're not supposed to produce and let people watch the bad version. Um, but the bad version is all we've gotten with Riverdale. I think it's going to take a little more time to see its general effect on the industry. Yes. I think one show can impact the entire industry. And I think this one is going to do it negatively, but time will tell. Nothing we predict ever happens. Yeah, but exactly. also, they don't. Act, they usually don't even know what's going to happen. Like the sh they oh, yeah. usually make it up. Yeah. As they yeah. I hate to say that, but it's true. 